he once dressed Princess Diana in drag to smuggle her into a nightclub. Freddie Mercury's flamboyance and his great sense of humor are well documented, but one of his lesser known antics involves taking Princess Diana out for a disguised night on the town. According to comedian Cleo Rocos, she, Mercury, the princess, and a couple of other friends were hanging out one night and eventually decided to mosey on down to a notorious gay bar. Diana wanted to go, but she didn't feel up to being recognized and mobbed by photographers. So, the resourceful Mercury improvised and dressed her up in drag. All decked out, she looked like a rather eccentrically dressed gay male model, and she and Freddie spent the evening giggling like naughty school children. He adored his cats and even dedicated an album to one. Many great artists love cats, and Freddie Mercury was no exception. According to reports, he had up to 10 felines at one time and even had them painted onto a vest he wore. His adoration of his cats also frequently made its way into his music, his album Mr. Bad Guy was dedicated to one of his felines, and to all the cat lovers across the universe. He sang on Darth Vader's shoulders to promote Star Wars. Despite that quirky lyric about not liking Star Wars in Bicycle Race, Mercury thought enough of the film to endorse it by singing while perched on the shoulders of Darth Vader, or a roadie dressed as Vader, anyway. In 1980, right around the time of The Empire Strikes Back, photographer Tom Callan snapped a shot of Mercury and the Sith Lord hamming it up during an encore performance of We Will Rock You. It was pandemonium, Callan's remembered years later. Everybody just thought it was so funny, so Freddy. It was so over the top. He used a piano as a headboard just in case a song came to him in the dead of night. When it came to seizing on inspiration when it occurred, Mercury didn't take any chances. He was so afraid of losing songs and melodies that he had a piano installed as a headboard and famously used it to lay down tunes that would come to him in the middle of the night. He was also flexible, so he'd simply reach around and start playing the rips backward. Bohemian Rhapsody is said to have been conceived this way initially, though Mercury apparently hated to play the song live because he considered himself a mediocre pianist. He vowed to sing until he fucking bled. Freddie Mercury's declining health was not easy for him to deal with, but he was determined not to let his failing body diminish his creativity, work ethic, or passion for life. According to Brian May, Queen's lead guitarist and backup vocalist, Mercury's last days were full of a lot of joy, strangely enough. Freddie was in pain, but inside the studio, there was a sort of blanket around, and he could be happy and enjoy what he liked doing best. Sometimes it would only last a couple of hours a day because he would get very tired. But during that couple of hours, boy, would he give a lot. Even when he was particularly ill and exhausted, Mercury, like his friend and collaborator David Bowie after him, soldiered on through sheer will and artistic commitment. May remembers that when he couldn't stand up, he used to prop himself up against a desk and down a vodka, saying, I'll sing it till I fucking bleed. He had a strong bond with his family. Born Farrakh Bulsara in Zanzibar, an island off the coast of Africa, Freddie Mercury grew up in a close, loving home where his artistic inclinations were encouraged, his parents, his sister, and his community alike celebrated his beautiful voice. Freddie's father, Bomi, passed away in 2003, and his mother, Ja, died in November 2016. But several years before she went, Ja granted the Telegraph an in-depth interview about her dear boy. Whatever he did or wore, I always saw in him the same child I knew. He would tell us lots of jokes, and I could always connect with him, Mrs. Bulsara recalled. It reassures me that he is still loved by people all over the world, but of course, none of them love him as much as his mother. As a deeply religious person, she claimed to have been mostly at peace with her son's death, but she also had moments of sorrow. One time she was watching the Olympic closing ceremony when Freddie's face suddenly appeared on the screen, and she cried out, Oh my dear boy, where are you? 
I miss him so much. They showed John Lennon, too, but there was much more applause for my Freddie. He left his best friend and soulmate almost all of his estate. Mercury always spoke of his girlfriend of many years, Mary Austin, as his soulmate and the love of his life. Freddie met Mary when he was still struggling and unknown. They lived together for seven years, supporting each other through Thick, Thin, and Freddie's rise to fame. Though their physical relationship allegedly ended after he realized the true nature of his sexuality, they remained best friends for the rest of his life. When Mercury died, he left Austin the bulk of his estate, including his mansion in London. As Mercury put it, our love affair ended in tears, but a deep bond grew out of it, and that's something nobody can take away from us. It's unreachable. All my lovers ask why they can't replace her, but it's simply impossible. His bandmates set up a fund for AIDS research. Though Mercury didn't officially announce to the public he had AIDS until the day before his death, his close friends knew about the nature of his illness, and he made sure to let them know he wanted the fight against the disease carried on in his name. Shortly after Mercury's death, Brian May, Roger Taylor, and Jim Beach established the Mercury Phoenix Trust with the aim of funding AIDS charities in locations all over the world. The organization has also helped to launch numerous medical research projects and vaccine studies, all things about which the famously generous Mercury would have been thrilled. Despite calling him Bucky, his childhood friends adored him. According to his schoolmates, Mercury was just as charismatic in his youth as adulthood, and he left his friends with a treasure trove of inspiration and fond memories. Young Freddy, known as Bucky because of his famous overbite, was once just a shy 12-year-old prodigy, starting his musical career in the Little Hill Station of Punchagni in Maharashtra. His childhood chums describe him as an artistic introvert who opened up in the presence of those he knew well. He was also way ahead of his time socially, though. According to one friend, he was a prodigy. He could play anything. He had the unique ability to listen to a song on the radio, just once, and be able to play it perfectly, his voice never changed over the years. If you listen to a Freddie Mercury CD, it sounds just like the young Freddie did back then. The same friend also remembered that in school plays, Mercury often played the women's roles, he had a habit of calling the boys darling, which was slightly shocking back then. Thank you for watching. If you enjoy this video press the like button, leave a comment letting us know what you think, and subscribe if you haven't already.